Good morning, folks. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our final and last class in 2 Corinthians. Uh, and today is Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo. It's also Holocaust Remembrance Day. It's. I thought that was Monday. Is well, they celebrate it. If it falls on a Sunday, they celebrate it on Monday. Uh huh. If it falls on a Friday, they celebrate it on the previous, the preceding Thursday. So this year it falls on today in this country, you know. But the Jews in Israel celebrate it on the sixth. Tomorrow. Whatever year it's different. Today, it's also, this year is. It's also National <coughs> National Plumbers Day. We don't have enough days for all these celebrations. I know, I just I made that one up. <laughs> Who could doubt it? All right, May 5th. <laughs> May 5th, and uh, summer is um, just about here. Mm -hmm. okay. So we thank the Lord for some warmer weather, but um, also some wetter weather, too. So today we're going to, uh, let's just uh, pray. We're going to go ahead and uh, kind of summarize uh, Paul's message to Corinth. Uh, looking at both first and second Corinthians, what he had to say to this church and why what was the whole um, and result of the message what you what you should walk away from um, with this. He wrote probably more to Corinth than any other single church, right? Between these two letters, and they're pretty lengthy compared to like Ephesians and Philippians and some of the even Galatians, which was so deep theologically. Um, so let's honor the Lord. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for the day that you've given to us. We thank you, Lord, this is the day that, that the Lord has made, and we'll rejoice today and be glad in it, Lord, because we're yours. Lord, we're not our own. We were purchased. We were bought with a price. And you've set us apart, called us, Lord, out of this world, Lord, out of darkness and into your wonderful and glorious light, and you've called us out, Lord, to set us apart and then to send us forth and send us out into the world, Lord, that you have made and that you're still the Lord of and you still have a plan and purpose for. We thank you, God, for that. We want, to, Lord, to be in the center of that. We want, Lord, to understand um, who we are in Christ more. So, Lord, make us to understand and see better and more clearly who you are, all that you are. Make it our heart's desire to want more of you, God, that we'll be more like you and be more just conformed into your image. Father, that we're more equipped, Lord, and uh, able and uh, to hear your voice and to, Lord, uh, to be sent out <coughs> to represent you just exactly the way of what you are and who you are and what you're calling us to do and what you're calling us to become. We just ask you... For Father, give sight to our eyes as we um, study your word and open our eyes and our hearts to um, the vision and the plan that you have for the church, how you're working in it, how you take the least likely and make them uh, the most um, uh, used and set up on a, like the city on a hill where your light is to shine forth to all nations. So strengthen us, Lord, today, and make us your, your people, your body, and your church, your bride, that you're coming back for. That will, Lord, just um, shine for, for Christ. And uh, in a way, Lord, that will honor you and make uh, the world see and know that you're, you are the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So uh, I want you to turn to... Uh, the very first, the very, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians, the opening chapter, at the very beginning, and, uh, and in fact, go to um, the uh, introduction in the study Bible. I'm going to take a look back at the, I'm looking at, with, I'm using the NIV study Bible and um, the, Christ, the Christian study. CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, uh, their study Bible is huge, and they've got a lot of great material, full-color pictures of uh, Corinth, which I showed you the isthmus that's there, and uh, some of the background there. It's, um, uh, the one I 
I'm reading now, I'm almost through all of it. Uh, but I would highly recommend this as a study Bible alongside the, the original NIV is probably the better translation. But the CSB is also uh, a good translation. It's a, uh, a newer one. It just came out about four or five years ago. And uh, it's more readable, so it's usable maybe more for new believers just coming in. The study Bible is um, really uh, helpful. It offers a lot. Uh, it has its weaknesses. Um, as I mentioned before, it, it tends to make generalizations and tends to be um, read into the text, which isn't really pure um, letting the text speak for itself. There the air went off right there. I was just going to say, okay. turn it, it might be time to turn it down. I'll just leave it like that. Um, so Corinth, I, actually, uh, you know, uh, before we start to, uh, this is going to be a day where uh, we can, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull out some things, the beginning of 1 Corinthians and then jumping all the way to the last chapter of 2 Corinthians, which we talked about last week. And uh, uh, if you've ever uh, learned how to scan books when you're in college, you spent a lot of years in college, there isn't enough time to read all of the required and recommended books in the courses. There just isn't. So you'll learn to do this. You read the first page, the first few paragraphs. Sometimes it might be a couple of pages. Um, and then the last few pages. And then, and then look at the highlights in between, how they got from here to there. Because usually you're going to get an introduction about what we're about to look at, what we're about to study, and how we're about to approach this. And then the end, where it's all summarized. Then you're going to get an idea of what that guy was trying to say, whether it's a book or whether it's a magazine article. And then when you look at the highlighted points, then you'll see how he's developing his argument. So at least you'll have an idea of what was being said, right? Sometimes we lose, we lose the forest for the trees, and uh, that contributes to doing bad theology in, in, in terms of the Bible. It's in, in, a term, in uh, terms of just um, you know politics or uh, a study, any other study of the social sciences, you're, you're not going to understand what's being said in order to dialogue if you don't understand what the person is saying. You gotta, in other words, you've got to look at the bigger picture in order to understand the trees, the, the individual points. You've got to see what it, where it fits in. In other words, that's called context. Context is king. That's right. That's Con classic Evelyn Woods speed reading. What's that? Classic Evelyn Woods speed reading. Yeah, the first few yeah. paragraphs, the end. There's a name that I haven't heard for about 30, 40 I years. I took that class. Yeah, I re I, now that you mention it, I remember that yep. name. Yep. But that's, what, that's be, her, her method. Used to be advertised on the radio all the time. That mm -hmm. take the oh, yeah. speed read. Yeah. Oh, that, there's a name I haven't heard in like four decades. Mm -hmm. Evelyn Woods. <clears throat> But yeah, so, um, and that's the way Paul uh, is also a very logical and methodical uh, writer. Um, and if you looked at his, his epistles are very easily to um, outline, look at the outlines of the books at the beginning, as opposed to, say, the book of Proverbs. You know, try to outline that. <laughs> you know, they're like, it's like somebody shuffled a deck, you know. <laughs> Until you understand uh, some of that too, because like the first seven to nine chapters are about something, a theme. It's who the author's speaking to and his, what he wants to communicate to his intended younger man. Um, but we should study the Bible and understand the context. There's historical and theological context, but looking at the text itself, since we understand all of Scripture to be inspired by God, Right? The Holy Spirit gave it word for word, letter for letter. Um, we we want to... Um, uh, but he also used men through whom he was going to speak to. These were men, apostles, who had a fatherly uh, relationship with the churches that he started. Um, I, you know, I thank God that, that I am your spiritual father. I birthed you, and, then, and so I'm caring for you. And then one statement even says, as, as, as a mother... 
who's about to give birth to her children. Now I labor over you. So there, it's, a, it's a spiritual parenting, and his care for them and concern is, is life and death. And he wants, and he's looking to see them grow. So, uh, especially in the light of um, living in a hostile world, and this is, this is really not particular, particular to Corinthians, the church at Corinth. It's like, um, it's like a, uh, a bait, it's like a mother rabbit. When we, when we lived in Lapeer, we used to have rabbit nests all the time. And they were burrow. <clears throat> if I let the, if the grass got, we had four acres to cut, so it didn't get cut every week. I cut this acre one week, and then the, the other side, uh, the, the, another week is, all I could have managed was about eight hours a, a week to put on the lawn. And then the, 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 they would burrow under the lawn you know, and then have babies. And I could not avoid that. It was terrible. I hate, hate to say this. To you, but I'd, I'd run over some once in a while. And, um, but it's like being, if you were to make your nest, and we, and there, by the way, there was, we had foxes, we had ferrets, we had groundhogs, we, because we had a pond, and the pond, uh, a stocked pond. And also we had otters there feeding on the stocked pond, on, on the bass that were in the pond. But we had foxes, wild foxes, wild turkey, and all these stuff on the property in the back. And, uh, and a shepherd husky that loved to chase them all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I was just thinking that, you know, here's these rabbits which are pretty much defenseless, having their babies on the lawn, in the lawn, Surrounded by all kinds of predators that, oh, and I, I, I forgot to mention the hawks that, that are flying overhead. You know, they can catch a, a mouse in a second the way they dive down and they see anything moving there. They know exactly where it is. They're, they're uh, a beautiful work in action, watching them things. Um, but it, this is what the, it's, it's kind of like what the church is. It's birthed and it's planted in the midst and in the center of all kinds of enemy territory and hostile around it that, would, that just wants to and loves to eat you up and it will. That's what, that's what Christ birthed us with and when we came in to be born again into this life and the, the life that we have in Christ, we're surrounded by hostile forces. The intellectual forces in the university that will mock you and tell you that you're not scientific and you're just <laughs> it's just superstition and both we, we pity you you fools, superstitious fools who think, still think that uh, the world has to be created by, by an intelligent God. Um, and then um, you've got, you've got um, forces uh, uh, of the family uh, against you. If, you're bo if, you're born, if you come into Christ and you have a family that does not know the Lord, they might have religion. That, makes it, that doesn't make it worse. You might, make, you might think that makes it easier to witness to them. <laughs> It makes it harder, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I got, uh, I, was, as I was sharing last week's class, after about an, uh, a year and a half of uh, my uh, coming to follow the Lord in a total radical 180 degree change, being brought, brought up and raised Catholic in a very strongly um, ingrained Catholicism, but yet the, in practical terms, they didn't go to church. They didn't practice and follow it. But that was the way, and there was no other way, and all other ways were false. And, you know, um, and I was kicked out of my house in about a year and a half into my walk with the Lord. You got to leave. Um, I was in. Yeah, was in, I was told I was an embarrassment to be with around family gatherings because of who I was and what I believed, and I was now just a, a Jesus fanatic. So um, we're around. Uh, that, that, that I, I was uh, forced out of a job in Tula and Dai, and, and around uh, a few years after that, I spent um, probably five, six, six, seven years in Tula and Dai through my college years, and I had one case where I was persecuted big time. The guys didn't want me there. Only found out later on that they were making, after the hours, and they punched out in their hours, they were using the machines to make guns that were not registered and not legal oh, wow. and they used their skills and their material and stuff like that and uh, they mocked me made fun of me I found 
oil in my McDonald's Coke when I from after lunch and mm -hmm. I, I drink it and I spit it out and I'm, I'm looking around and down at the end of this plant down there, there's three guys there just laughing at me, looking down there laughing at me. I, I had to put up with that stuff for a couple, two or three years I was there. And uh, that was just that. And then I told you about, and then in the college, I told you about getting flunked out of English 101 because of just a paper of just quoting a scripture and making a strong statement from that would have been, <laughs> it would have looked like absolute truth about something that this, this is what God has to say. And I, he, did, he, he, he did not want me in the class and he ran me out. I don't want you in my class. If you stay here, I'm gonna flunk you. So here, I, I had to get, I ex had to experience, and, it, and I'm, not, I'm not ungrateful, I'm grateful because I learned from the beginning of being a child of God I am not, I'm not home here. This is not our home. And I'm not, in fact, welcome. My home, kicked out. My work, kicked out. And my school and my education, driven out, mocked. Why? Because of naming the name of Jesus Christ with an authority that comes from his word. And it wasn't that I was trying to do that. I was trying to I was trying to love people and show them that what I had changed my life and would give the, do the same for them and give them a life of love and peace and joy. I mean, I had to come to the place of wanting to check out of this life before I finally broke and surrendered my will to him. That's, that was my experience, right? So um, it was only um, the, lo the love that compelled me, that wanted to give that same light to other people. I'm not going to compromise with it. Without Christ, you're dead. He's the way to life. We've got to let the light shine. Guess what? The darkness doesn't like the light. And the Corinthian church um, was surrounded by, they were surrounded by excess because they had, because of the nature of it being a port city and it, and an isthmus between two major waterways and all of the nations that traded and went from one side. They ended up with wealth in both financial and material wealth and also the cultural um, plurality that was there because from all, all of um, the influences of all the wealth around them. It's, it, it, that's, that's what Corinth was. They weren't unhappy about it. It's like wine, women, and song. Can't wait till tomorrow for the next party. You know, <laughs> who's who's going who's gonna who's gonna have the party next week? You know, um, but with Paul, they he he with Corinth he he had a he had to remind them that they are separate and apart and to live separate and apart from the west rest of the world. With Thessalonica, they got. A taste of more what my experience was. They got persecuted, and they got driven out, and they got rejected. These are a predominantly Gentile church, northern Greece, and uh, their their own, uh, and, and it's it's a seed of paganism, and their own uh, persecuted them. But in the case of Thessalonica, it made them stronger and made them cling on to what they knew to be true and right. I know there's no other way. I, would, I just came back from the edges of the pits of hell. I knew that the way I was going was going to send me to hell. I ain't going back there. And I know that if those, those that are still in this darkness are going to end there if they don't see this light. There's not a question about right and wrong. Who's got the right way? It's a question about where are people in, in their position towards the light, right? So Thessalonica um, experienced extreme persecution. It, they were famous for what they had gone through. And Paul begins that letter with thanksgiving because of the way they received the truth and hung on to it in the midst of the opposition that they had. And they were holding on to it. And their... Um, their work, their faith that was manifested through work and their um, 
hope that was manifested through love, these things, they were an example of what it meant to follow Christ in the midst of a dark world. Corinth had all these gifts, um, if, you, if you will, you have an introductory page on uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, on 1 Corinthians, the study Bible, and you see um, where it says the city of Corinth. Population of about 250,000 free persons, as many as 400,000 slaves, unfree persons. In a number of ways, it was the chief city of Greece. Okay, then you've got its commerce, its culture, its religion, its, Im its uh, immorality. Well, how does that fit in with culture, religion, and, and its commerce? So you've got possessions. Because it was located off the Corinthian Isthmus, when you think of the word Isthmus, think of the Panama Canal. You've got two continents, North America and South America, and they're connected by one little tiny strip of land about 20 miles. And then it's cut through with um, a canal, Panama Canal. And that little canal is just big enough for a ship, a big ship to go through, or maybe two smaller ships to pass through. And that's it. That's connecting two major continents. That's what Corinth was. It was like an isthmus that connected mainland Greece with this gigantic island just off the south, southern coast of Greece in the Aegean Sea. And so and Corinth was situated right there. So they had all of this trade. Oh, and uh, as I was reading this, uh, the introduction in the CSB study Bible, which is com it's got a complete picture of both the city and, and the isthmus right there, and uh, several pages of um, introduction about this. They, and here's the, here's the actual pi the picture, you can see the canal. This is an actual photo from the top, from, from the air. Um, a narrow land bridge uh, connecting two um, city ports. Um, well, they're not. Well, it makes a statement that in, in order for um, ships to get through from the one mile, this is about, it looks like about six miles six miles east of uh, Corinth, two miles north of Corinth in the port of St. Crea. Uh, they had to, uh, anyway, the point is, on the larger ships, they, what they had to do is they had, they had to take the cargo off the ships and put it on, and put it on rollers or on carts and, and cart them, probably by horse, to the other side of the isthmus and then reload them onto other ships because the, because the canal wasn't big enough for the, the, the giant ship. So they had to unload, carry it across the other side of the canal, and then reload it on other ships. Um, and that, that's the way that worked. So a lot of, a lot of commerce was there. Lo, located um, back on your, your NIV <coughs> by the introduction. <coughs> Off this Corinthian isthmus, it was a crossroads for travelers and traders. They had two harbors, Sencrea, six miles to the east of Saronic Gulf, and Lycaon, a mile and a half to the west of the Corinthian Gulf. Goods flowed across the isthmus on the Dialcus, a road by which smaller ships could be hauled fully loaded across, by which uh, car cargoes of larger ships could be transported by wagons from one side to the other. Goods flowed through the city from Italy and Spain to the west and from Asia Minor, Phoenicia, and Egypt to the east. The culture, along, along, uh, although Corinth was not a, uni a university town like Athens, okay, Athens, you know, re well, think of the Acropolis, and remember Paul went there and preached in the book of Acts? That's where all the philosophers would gather and debate the issues. What, what does it all mean? And where did we come from? And what's the meaning of life as they were getting older, finding out that, hey, my eyes are going, I can't see anymore, and I can't walk anymore. This, <laughs> and out of that comes all, all the philosophy and the philosophers and the intellectual and the places where young men would want to go to get schooled and educated. Um, the universities kind of began there. Also along with that, um, 
see, now Corinth was not the intellectual center, it was the center of commerce. But it was also a center of paganism and what all of the gods. Now they had access to, to the gods coming from the east and the west, those nations we just mentioned. E Egypt to the east of them, Spain and um, Italy to the north of them, and um, actually, the, the, actually the, the Roman religion was just a, a, a rehashing of ancient Greek, the ancient Greek pantheon and their, their gods, which uh, the Greek culture ruled and reigned, as we know from biblical history, right from about 333 BC when Alexander the Great conquered the Persians, and it reigned for about 200 years, about 165 AD, then the Romans conquered the Greeks. And they just took their gods uh, and just renamed them to Roman names. So um, they, the Romans were not an intellectual people. The Greeks were well known to be a highly intellectual people. That's why the New the, That's why the Romans kept the Greek. Not only did they keep the Greek pantheon and their religious system, they kept the Greek language because all, all the best uh, literature and, and the best uh, science and everything was written in Greek, and they cer certainly um, couldn't improve their language with their own. So they made, Greek was still the speaking language or the teaching language. Not, it wasn't spoken in, in uh, the streets and in the marketplace, but in the at places of education. Mm -hmm. And the New Testament was written in Greek, even though it was during the Roman Empire. Paul's writing in Greek. Why that? Greek, Greek was um, long um, defeated because the culture and uh, the education was strong there. And along with that, the religious system. So Paul goes straight into the heart of Greece, goes, lands in Athens, and is debating with the philosophers of the air, even quoting them about the God that we serve and believe is the God who you recognize as the unknown God. Remember that part? and that he made all things. That God who made everything, to whom all the rest of your other lesser gods will some, some way um, give an account to because they must have come from him. Um, he's the one who now made himself known in the person of Jesus Christ who was prophesied from ages ago that would come and step foot on this planet. And he did just that. On this date, at this time, born in Bethlehem, in Jerusalem, he died, was nailed to the cross here. He's the one that we're proclaiming. He's preaching the gospel. He can preach the gospel to them, both from a historical point of view and as the one who not only fulfills, like to the Jew in the synagogue, he would speak to them about Christ fulfilling all the prophecies of the Old Testament that were written to them and for them, right? Then they kicked him out. So then he go to the Greeks, and he proclaimed him as the ant Christ, as the answer to all of their false gods and their Greek pantheons in their temples. And who gets up and rejects them, but the ones who are making their living creating the false idols to Diana and Athena. I heard something really interesting the other day from a teacher that I respect, that Play Socrates spoke to Plato one time and said he, he believed that a, that a deity could forgive sin, but he doesn't know how he would do it. So those I, that, that idea was rattling around like, among the Greeks if that story is to be believed, and I don't see any reason why I can't believe that. Yeah. So that was kind of, I thought that was interesting. That is interesting. So that Paul comes along and tells them how that deity did it. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly how. Yeah. How can somebody who's you know guilty of a mass murder, how can you not you know, eliminate him off the space of the earth and, and have no qualms about it. He did the same thing to others. How was there forgiveness for someone like that the, who did the, the utmost and the epitome of evil to somebody else and still call that one just and righteous? Only, only the God who defines what is righteousness and holiness has the power and the authority to do that. And, he, and, he, and when you think of it, he... It cost him giving his own very own life to do that. So it it brings together it brings together the legal requirements of the law and the full um, 
purpose of, of God and creation for man all at the same time, which is relationship. God made us for a relationship. I and mean, if it's all legal, we're, we're all lost without hope. But thank God that the God who's the Lord of righteousness and morality is also the Lord of life. And he's a father. And that's a concept that neither the Jew nor the Greek could get to call him father. And that he could, and that, that, that A, he could forgive sin, but B, that he'd even want to. Because, you know, and in, in their mind, it's like the, the righteous judge would say, don't make me come down there, <laughs> you know. But in, but in the, the, the message of the gospel says, even before the foundations of the word, of the earth, God decided and determined, I'm going to go down there and, come and be with them and be one of them and sacrifice myself for them. And that just, it answers all the questions. You know, unless you, unless you don't want... And after that, if you have any arguments, you're arguing against the truth because you don't want it. Right? So I'm not going to have time to read all of the rest of these things, uh, but point out that number three, looking at the religion in Corinth, there's at least 12 temples there to different deities. Whether they were all in the use during Paul's time, we don't know for certain. One of the most famous was dedicated to Aphrodite, the goddess of love whose worshippers practice religious prostitution. About a fourth of a mile north of the theater stood the temple of, um, how's that, Asclepius, the god of healing in the middle of the city of the 6th century BC. Temple of Apollo was located. In addition, the Jews had established a synagogue. The inscribed lintel of it has been found in place in the Museum of Old Corinth. And then the, the immorality there, the, you, you, you just look at their, they're practicing uh, in the name of worship of these false gods, prostitution, um, that's going on right there. Um, that immorality itself was rampant. It was like almost in a way of, in a way of the religion justifying the, um, the base natural desires within man, which is lust. Of course, you know, pride, lust, and greed. Um, and the third one was is anger, the three big sins of man, which it, which really interpreted as vengeance. Social justice is really, not, most of the time, nothing more than vengeance and uh, um, personal justice. So, but the immorality, Corinthians was uh, known was famous, famous for. At one time, 1,000 sacred prostitutes served in Aphrodite's temple. So widely known did the immorality of Corinth become that the Greek verb to Corinthianize came to mean to practice sexual immorality. In a setting like this, no wonder why the Corinthian church was plagued with so, so many numerous problems. Um, and that's what he begins to uh, open that letter with. I'm going to in the few minutes we have left, I'll kind of tie something in here that I read here. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from the introduction on the CSB study Bible um, for you, and uh, then we can uh, kind of get a, a book to bookend 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 Corinthians 13, kind of bookend these, these letters with this. Um, it talks about how the church of Corinth was started and so forth. Um, and then he says the, the, about the message and purpose. This is the CSV study Bible. Um, I'll just read a few sentences here, this, this paragraph here. And he points out, in all of Paul's letters, with the exception of Galatians, all, the, all of Paul's letters except Galatians, the main theme of the letter can be identified at the beginning by the content of the thanksgiving 
or by the stated reason for his giving thanks. In other words, at the beginning of the church, Paul the Apostle to the church at Corinth or Thessalonica, I thank my God for all of you because this, that, or the other. And in each case, it's something different. And in that, there you're going to find the reason why, he's, why he wrote this letter and what he has to say to you at this point in time and what he wants you to know, what you need to hear. The premise for, of each of his letters also is usually found in the salutation beginning the letter as well as in the introductory prayers that follow the Thanksgiving section within his prescript and thanksgiving of 1 Corinthians, true to his custom, Paul presented the main theme of his letter that all believers belong to the Lord. Jesus is Lord. Believers are his possession. For Paul, whatever issue was discussed, the answer to the issue was always addressed with a reminder of the Lord's authority over them. He used more than 75 idioms from first century slavery to speak about believers relationship to the Lord, their master. Those who call upon the name of the Lord, chapter 1, verse 2, are those who call upon his name as a sign of submission. In 1 Corinthians, name, the word name, is almost always synonymous with authority in the name of, the authority of. Paul's purpose in writing 1 Corinthians was to motivate the Corinthian church to acknowledge the Lord's ownership of them and the implications this had in their lives. Therefore, you must behave this way because he is your Lord, he owns you. Remember, remember 1 Corinthians 6, 19? You're not your own, you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. So everything that, <clears throat> all of his instructions about morality, about separation, from worldly practices are based on the fact that you're his, you're not yours. You don't have the right, you don't have the right to say, well, um, yeah, that's that's cool for you, but I think I'd rather do it this way. I like this. <clears throat> no, <clears throat> we, we don't call the shots about how we live anymore than we call up the shots about what we can believe to be true about who he is. <clears throat> so this is Paul's address. The key topics Paul addressed in his overarching theme of the ownership and authority of the Lord include, crit, crit, uh, there's a, a list of these, Christian unity. Remember Corinthians 1 <clears throat> begins with the division in the church. Some are of Paul, some are of Paulo, some are, some are of this, and they're all fragmented. The unity that is ours in Christ is the church. Morality, um, practices that are <clears throat> that are ungodly to be rejected, the role of women in the church, spiritual gifts, and then in chapter 12 to 14, <clears throat> and then finally, the resurrection. <clears throat> We're running out of time, so I'm going to have to cut to the chase. Open up to 1 Corinthians 1, <clears throat> and I'm just going to read to you the opening <clears throat> introduction to 1 Corinthians 1. I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> and then we'll go back to the end of 2 Corinthians 13. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will that sustains our brother, to the church of God at Corinth, to those who were sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now that's a unique description of the church. Those who were set apart, you're not of this world, you are called from this world, out of this world, and set apart from this world to be something separate from this world. There's separation there. You're sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints, made holy, set apart out of the world and made holy with all those in every place who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours, the Jew and the Gentile, this in view. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the thanksgiving part, the gratitude. I always thank my God for all of you because of the grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus. First word in the book, grace. 
God's riches at Christ's expense, that it was a gift, a free gift. What we have been given and what we care, carry on and what we bear in this world is the gift of God that was given to us that we didn't deserve or earn and we can't pay back. And that's what we're, that's, that's, that defines who we are. And it defines our purpose and it should define what we do. The gift of God, the finished work of Christ at the cross. This is the grace. I'm thanking God that you are recipients of, of this grace, God's riches at Christ's expense, so that in every way, in all speech and in all knowledge, that you'll walk and live with this testimony, so that you do not lack in any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ when we're looking towards Him and looking for His return. Um, so, he's, so he goes to pray for it. They are strengthening towards this end and that they will live and walk in a blameless way. Okay, so that's that. And now I'm going to go to the very end of 2 Corinthians 13, which we um, did read last time. And that was the one where um, he points out um, um, Christ was um, crucified in, in weakness and he lives by the power of God, so we are also weak in him. But in dealing with you, we will live with him by God's power. So examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith, whether you're actually walking the faith, whether the faith is being lived out in your behavior, your speech, your actions, and your truth. Are you walking that way in that kind of, with that kind of authority? Um, move down to verse... Um, 10. This is why I'm writing these things while absent, so that when I'm there, I won't have to deal harshly with you in keeping with the authority the Lord gave me to build you up and not to tear you down. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Become mature. Be encouraged. Be of the same mind. Be at peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints send you greetings. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. There's that benediction. So there's just kind of like the, uh, the beginning and the end of Corinth. And it applies to every one of us in, our, in the church to, as his church today. Why we saw so much more. I feel like we just uh, scratched the surface. But, um, but I'm looking forward to um, Thessalonians, and I think that's, wow, that's, that's even, if, they, if Paul went through all these different things he had addressed with Corinth, he's more general, but more, um, much more positive and encouraging with the Thessalonian church. It is awesome. Well, folks, let's, let's pray as uh, it's 10 o'clock. Lord, we thank you for God, that you chose us, Lord, to be in Christ out of, out of this world and set us apart. God, as your own, as your own to whom, Lord, you put your affection and your love on us as a bride to whom you, you cherish and you're going to come for and you're going to come and when we see you, we're going to be completely made like you, just as you are. We praise you, Father, for that, that it's all of God that we're in Christ and it's of you that you're the one who's doing your work in us to bring us to completion. I pray your blessing on, on, on your people today. Fill us with your spirit. And let you, we pray that, uh, Lord, that you would inhabit the praises of your people. And as we go, let that thanksgiving and praise, God, shine, um, Lord, up, up to you and, and glorify your name, that you would uh, arise in and through your church as we're sent out into the world. Lord, be glorified, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here we go.